All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming again. Um, it is my pleasure to, to uh, welcome back Barry Honig as this year's uh, 2016 Steenbach Lecture. Um, yesterday, I neglected to say anything about Harry Steenbach, who, um, you know, whose whose work in sort of in over time is is generated lots of money that allows us to invite all of these uh, lovely speakers to campus. Um, so in the in the 1920s, uh, Harry Steenbach invented a uh, procedure for irradiating milk and converting a compound in milk into vitamin D and felt that um, that this was worth some money and Quaker Oats wanted to license the the invention um, and so I think uh, Steenbach he went to the administration and he said I think this is worth some money you know we should we should patent this we should do something and at the time the administration went we're a university. We don't care about these things. You're supposed to laugh now because, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. What a what a difference a century makes. But um, but in any case, uh, the result of that was the sort of the first technology transfer office at a university campus. And ours is the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation that's run as a nonprofit. <coughs> so, the proceeds from you know, from that and other inventions from the, de the department um, kind of help, uh, you know, help us to, to run nice programs and invite prominent people to campus. So, um, so we have, uh, today is the second of the Steenbach lectures. So if you would please um, hel help me in welcoming back Barry Honig from Columbia University and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute to give the second in this series. We'd uh, love to welcome Barry. Thank you, Julie. So uh, yesterday, I, uh, I gave a talk which was, I, I'd say, although it had a strong cell biological component, was really traditional structural biology applied to particular biological problems. Uh, today, I'm going to talk on a, on a, on a very different tone. Uh, and my goal, as I sort of say in this title, is to find a way to integrate structural biology with systems biology. Uh, and the reason I, th I want to do that, other than I find it interesting, is uh, systems biology, especially people looking at networks of interactions, uh, is basically uh, a field of people who, who know very little about proteins, who very, know very little about molecules. In effect, uh, proteins and DNA are are points on a diagram. And the hope is that our, if we have an understanding of the molecules involved, we can find a way to uh, sort of expand both fields and also expand what we as structural biologists uh, know and what we can do with our structures. So an example of what I'll be primarily talking about today is uh, to take this you know, one of these interactomes, which is supposed to, rec every point is a protein and there are lines connecting the points, to somehow put a structural face on that sort of interaction. And more specifically, to use three-dimensional structure to infer interactions that you couldn't infer any other way. So that's, that's the goal of my talk. And what I'm going to do is, uh, basically, uh, we sort of published a paper a few years ago describing how to do this. Uh, I'm going to go over what's in that paper and then show what's happened since then and then point to the future in terms of specific applications, uh, none, of none of which are complete, but I want to give you a sense at least of what I think is possible. Um, so to use structure uh, in, in ways, so one of, the, one of the goals, of course, is to use structure on a scale that it isn't normally used. As we really want to be able to use structure on a, what we call a genome-wide scale. So there are a number of things we have to do. One is use homology models. These are models of proteins derived from known crystal structures. Everyone knows there aren't enough crystal structures to cover every, uh, every protein sequence. The second thing I'll be showing you and talking about is structural alignments. What we're going to use, we're going to use structural similarity between proteins as a way of expanding 
the connections between proteins that can be inferred, excuse me. And uh, the third is to use statistical inference in, in the context of protein structure. And I want to show you how, how we do that. But to do all of these things, we have to relax our standards of what, you know, how we use structure. So if you're interested in an enzyme mechanism, you care about every angstrom and every kilocalorie. If you're using structure on a genomic scale, you can't worry about that detail. You want to extract information any way you can. So uh, yesterday had angstroms and kilocalories, today won't. Uh, so the first point to, to make is if we look at the number of uh, the structural coverage, say, of the human genome, there are about 5,000 proteins in the protein data bank for which there is a structure for at least one protein domain. Not the whole protein, but at least one domain. You look at homology, databases of homology models or what one can construct with existing software, you get about 12,500 together. Uh, there, are, there is some structural information for about 18,000 human proteins. Uh, if we look at protein-protein interactions, from about 20,000 proteins, there are 206 million possible interactions. Uh, there are about 1,000 complexes in the PDB, and there are about, well, 169,000 interactions in, exist in existing databases that may be taken from the literature, may be taken from high throughput methods such as yeast 2 hybrid. So we don't really know how many protein-protein interactions there are in, the, uh, so in human cells. And indeed, the word interaction can be deceiving. What does it really mean? So what, mo most of what I'm certainly thinking of primarily is two proteins that form a complex. But then there may be proteins that are in a multi-protein complex that don't interact with each other directly, but are at least are structurally related. And then there can be a third case where two proteins are in a pathway one affects the other, so they're, in a way, interacting, but they're not physically interacting. And just even, so when people say there are so and so many interactions, it's not always clear what's meant. The truth is that we don't really know how many interactions of any kind there are. Okay, so uh, I've s said briefly in the last slide that we can use homology models to ex extend the reach of structural information. And I'll add that homology models can be very good, they can be very bad. And at one level, I'd like them to be good, but another level, I don't necessarily care because even if a ba the hope is that I can extract information even from a bad model, and I'll get back to that. Maybe a bad model has some clues to that, that, that can be used in a gainful way. The second way we use structure is with finding relationships between different proteins with structural alignments. And I want to show you how proteins are very often classified and actually argue against classification. So uh, there is a SCOP database of protein structures. Uh, and in this blue circle, I represent members of a protein family. These would be proteins uh, that have a clear sequence relationship, a clear functional relationship. Then in the orange ellipse here are proteins in a superfamily, and these are proteins that are more distantly related but nevertheless have a functional and, and perhaps detectable sequence relationship. And then there's the third classification that people use of, of as a protein fold. And a protein fold basically is a way of describing what a protein looks like. And uh, this is where uh, I for years have sort of had a bee in my bonnet. I don't like the term protein fold. I, I, I don't mind saying a protein has a fold, but to classify proteins based on what they look like, number one, there's no objective way of doing it, so you're really dependent on somebody's opinion. Uh, but it can obscure information. And in fact, I'll show you in a second, there are connections between proteins that are classified as very is having very different folds, and we want to use that information because it's that information that allows us to use structure to find distant relationships that can't be identified with sequence. Let me give you an example. Here's three proteins that are classified as having different folds, certainly looking 
at them, you might not see any connection. Uh, but each one of them has a structural fragment uh, which looks similar. And if you superimpose them, you see that these three fragments uh, superimpose well. And this, the, the, the superposition, geometric alignment, is, is basically central to everything I'll be talking about. There are many algorithms that superimpose secondary structure elements. Uh, we have our own, but there, there are many good ones. And it's basically something you might do by eye, just superimpose secondary structure elements, find common features. What's interesting in this case that even though these proteins are different, once you superimpose this, these substructures, you find that they all bind to cation in the same location. Does this mean that they evolved from some ancestral cation binding fragment? We don't know if it's convergent or you know, divergent evolution, but this would be an example of extracting information from structure alignment that you would never get from sequence. Uh, and we use the term structural blast to mean by so when you run blast you, you run sequence alignment and you look for small motifs that align. Here we're looking for small structural motifs that align and trying to use that again to infer, infer function. So structural blast will be a, an, in, an integral part of, of what I'll be talking about. As I said yesterday, I'll say it again, please feel free to interrupt at, at any time if there are things I say that you'd like me to clarify or that annoy you. Um, yes? Are magnesium and zinc monovalent in the previous slide or diamond? I don't know. It's a very good question. I think they're, I think they're divalent. I assume they are, but I, I'm not certain. So what I'll be doing uh, in, in the context of this seminar is, is the following. Let's say I have a protein and I want to know what it binds to. And that could be DNA, it could be a small molecule, it could be another protein. I have in the database other proteins that bind to something else, say this pink sphere. So in this case, I might align this green protein to the purple one. And the geometric transformation that turns the green into the purple also moves the sphere onto the surface of the purple. And if I do that with other structural neighbors, in this case, I, I'm saying that I, I find that all these small, these spheres bind in the same location, and that might suggest that this is a hot spot for binding small molecules, for example. So it's, th this, is, this is the sort of the notion that we're using, and these other spheres could be small molecules, they could be other proteins. But the basic idea is if we transform, we geometrically move this protein onto this protein, carry with it its ligands, we have a hypothesis as to where our query protein might bind other proteins. That's, we have to prove that that hypothesis works, but that's the basic notion. So the first sort of way we've used this is to take a protein and to predict where on a surface it will bind other proteins. Now, most methods in the literature will take this protein and, for example, look for a hydrophobic patch on the surface or region of sequence conservation. So the protein is analyzed for its own physical properties. There's a hydrophobic patch here. You say, well, maybe that's an interaction site. What we're doing is, is different. We look for a structural neighbor, in this case, the red protein, superimpose the green on the red, and just like I showed you in the last slide, infer that perhaps the green protein binds other proteins in this location. Uh, and, you know, this might give us an interface, but of course we only do it once. It's meaningless. The algorithm that we derived or designed is the following. We take a protein of unknown function and we look for its structural neighbors. A structural neighbor, okay, is a protein that looks like my query protein. We superimpose Q on neighbor one, neighbor two, neighbor three. Now, if Q, when I su do the superposition, there are two amino acids in the uh, neighbor protein that bind a ligand P1 or another protein P1, and we count those. So this, these two appear twice. Then we go to another neighbor and we count the ones, the residues that are aligned in the interface for neighbor two, neighbor three. We add them up, 
and then we end up with a hot spot, shown here in red, which are regions on my query protein that align to the interface of other proteins. So I hope that's clear. That's the way it works. Um, and uh, it works very well. I mean, I, it's, I, I don't like doing this sort of thing, but I could tell you, I have my own figure showing how well we do, but I was delighted to see somebody else did a comparison of the many, many methods to predict interfacial residues. And uh, ours comes out the best, except for theirs. Uh, <laughs> But now we have a new method that's a little better. But anyway, this is supposed to tell you that this method works, works very well. Uh, better than methods that are based on, say, hydrophobicity alone. But we've since added that feature to what we do. We simply, I'm not going through all the, this slide, but we look at the propensity of every amino acid to be in a protein-protein interface integrate that with the structural information, and we, this, again, I, I'm just showing you, we do better than we did before. So my, my point here is that using this sort of uh, structural alignment, we can infer where one protein might bind to another protein. And it's supposed to convince you that this is a reasonable way to approach the problem, but it doesn't yet tell you how we deal with protein-protein interactions. And uh, the way we do that is just an extension of what I've been telling you. So, but I have to tell you how we do it because that's crucial. Here is a structure in the protein data bank of a complex, in the protein data bank. And now what we do is we want to know, say, if, so these are red and blue, we want to know if the cyan protein binds to the purple protein. So we superimpose the cyan on the red the purple on the blue, get a model for the interaction of the purple with the cyan, and infer, I haven't told you how we do it, that the cyan burns to the, binds to the purple protein. Yes? So if you sort of draw an analogy to the sequence class, how do you account for sort of gap element and the, and the fact that you might have substructures that align but not sort of full structure, and you might have deviations? I'll get to that in a minute. I, I, literally, I just want to show you this is what we're going to do. I haven't told you how we, done it, how we do it yet. This is the goal, to use complexes as templates for, for other possible, known complexes as templates for other complexes. So I'll see exactly how, how we do that. Um, so here, here is, this is the crucial slide in our, in our method. Uh, and I'm, I, you know, I'll take you through it. Um, I have two proteins, query A and query B. And I want to know if they form a complex. So the first thing I need if I'm using structural information is a model for the whole protein or parts of that protein. And this model, model A and model B, can come, if they're crystal structures from the protein data bank, it can come from homology modeling databases or whatever. I have a model. The next step is to look for the structural neighbors of each of these proteins by structural alignment. So we take protein A and we align it to every protein in the protein data bank to see what it looks like. And we, f and we find on the average 1,500 neighbors per structure. And here, I'll say right off, that, a that we have very loose criteria for a neighbor. So we require that a minimum of three secondary structure elements superimpose. So, because we're just looking for fragments or, or the whole protein, whatever. So if there are 1,500 neighbors per each, there's two million possibilities for a complex between this guy's neighbors and this guy's neighbors. 1,500 squared is about two million. And in general, we find around 300 complexes per pair of proteins. So we now, we now superimpose the yellow on the brown, say, the green on this pink, and we come up with a model for the complex. So we have, we have a model based on this superposition. And now we have to score it. And, I, and the number of complexes we get is enormous. Um, we are using 18,000 proteins. We find 1.5 billion possible pairs of interactions from this procedure. So we have to score literally billions of, of, of models. But, so the first point to, to make is we find that using this procedure 
of looking for structural neighbors, we have an enormous number of models, much larger, and this is how we get to a genomic scale. The question is, how do you score so many models? Okay, so that's what I'm going to tell you now. Uh, so the first thing we do is we have our PDB structure. And we know from the structure what residues are in the interface. Now the first thing we do is align our two models to this structure. And the first criterion we have is simply how good is the alignment. If se six secondary structure elements overlap, that's better than three. So we have a score for that. The next thing we ask is, is the alignment in the interface? And this sort of addresses, what if the alignment was just on over here and over here? Then, then there would be no interface in the complex and we'd throw it, that would get a bad score. And the third thing we do is ask, are the residues that we predict to be in the interface, are they likely to be interfacial? That is, statistically, are they likely to be interfacial residues? And we get a score for that. And we combine them, in a I'll show you in a minute, using sort of Bayesian statistics to get a score for this complex. The reason we can deal with billions of models is we never calculate a pairwise energy. We only calculate the properties, the one on the left and the one on the right. So it becomes a linear rather than a quadratic problem. That's how we can evaluate so many models. Um, so how do we do it? And uh, I'm not a statistician. I hope nobody in the audience is an expert. Uh, but you, you, the way you, you do, do it, well, I'm learning, I'm learning. You do this with Bayesian inferences the following. You have a positive test set. These are proteins for which we know, we, we know form a complex, say. And a negative set, which are proteins that we believe don't form a complex. Now, if there's a property X, whatever that property is, uh, some of the proteins in the positive set have a certain value for x, some of the proteins in the negative set have a value for x. And if there's a higher probability, if you have x, if you have a higher probability of being in the positive set than the negative set, that means there's some information in that, in that parameter. So this is the probability of a given x, of given in the hc sex having, uh, set having a property x. So uh, it's basically an enrichment in, in a case where you know the answer is positive. So this is, and then from this ratio, you get what's called a likelihood ratio, uh, which is, again, the, just the ratio of the probabilities of being in the positive set relative to the negative set given x, a value of x. The nice thing about Bayesian statistics is that if you have independent sources of evidence, you get a likelihood ratio of their combination by just multiplying the individual likelihood ratios. So for example, uh, if you get a structural score, and this score, as you'll see in a second, might be they're also co-expressed, then you multiply the likelihood ratios to build up a total likelihood ratio. But is the, I hope this is clear, but this is, this is sort of crucial to what we do. The next thing we need to do, I haven't convinced you yet that any of this works. I'm just telling you how we set up the infrastructure. The next thing we do is create test sets. So our positive, there are databases of protein-protein interactions. We look at all of them and we only accept interactions that appear in two, with two literature references. And we call that our positive test set. And our negative test set is basically, in this case, the other 200 million interactions, some of them which will be true, but most of them will be false, because it's just everything possible. So that's how we define our positive and negative test set. And here are the sources of evidence we use. The first is the one I just told you, structural modeling. And just hopefully to make it clear, before we did anything else, we looked at these three scores and we calculated a likelihood ratio from structure alone based on structure alignment, based on these interface properties, we calculate that independently. Then we'll go, I'll get to the orange ones in a minute, uh, phylogenetic profile are, do, do, the, is, do, do these two proteins exist in multiple organisms? Are they always there together? Coexpression is pretty straightforward, are they coexpressed? 
And again, we have to use our positive and negative sets to get a likelihood ratio for co-expression. Go terms, go is gene ontology, it's, it's an annotation of protein function, and if they have a similar go term, that increases the probability that they'll interact. And finally, orthology is do their sequence neighbors and other organisms interact. So each of those is tested independently and we get a likelihood ratio. Each of these makes a contribution. The two remaining orange ones are in part structure-based. Uh, one is, see I've been talking about protein-protein interactions with, between structured domains, but what about interactions between a structure, structured domain and an unstructured protein? So the way we deal with that is two methods. There's a database of such interactions and we simply ask, does our protein have a structured domain that looks like one in this database and a sequence with a, sim a sequence similarity to a known motif. So we, it's, we're not being very clever here. We're using existing databases to infer an interaction. Uh, similarly, if there is a protein sequence bound to a domain and we know its structure, we can ask is, you know, do our proteins conform to this structure? I, I don't want to go into this in detail. But this basically is, is the logic of what we do. Uh, I think I'll skip this one. So this sort of summarizes the, the total approach. I showed you this first, so the, this, this left part of the slide, this is the structural modeling score. We then take all these other sources of evidence integrate it with structure in this Bayesian framework and come up with a score called, which we call our PREPI score. PREPI is supposed to mean predicting protein-protein interactions. Um, just for a moment of diversion, I thought it was a cute name because I know what a PREPI is, but, some, but most people not born in the United States don't know what PREPI, a PREPI is and most people under 30 don't know what a PREPI is. So. But for those of you that do, it, it, ha it was supposed to be funny. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that's, but, but it means predicting protein-protein interactions. So this is what we do, we t and uh, when we're finished, we have a database which you can access. Uh, you type in the name of a protein. It will give you its interaction partners. It will give you scores. Uh, it tells you where the evidence comes from uh, for that partner. And uh, ultimately, it's meant as a hypothesis testing or generating procedure. This is, this is sort of the nature of, of, of systems biology. It's statistical in nature. But we've succeeded in using structure on a, on, a, on a really unprecedented scale, and that's something we're obviously very pleased about. One thing that I, is perhaps obvious to statisticians, but I sort of found it amusing, if we use structural evidence alone, we make predictions for about 130,000 pairs of interactions. If we use non-structural evidence alone, 115,000. When we combine them, uh, we make predictions for over a million interactions. And that, and our predictions, what we call high confidence predictions, are based on a likelihood ratio greater than 600. The number will mean nothing to you, except it corresponds to a false positive rate of about 10 to the minus three. So why is this true? Let's say we have a weak interaction from, weak prediction from structure, likelihood ratio less than 600, but also uh, the proteins are co-expressed and have a similar function, then that will amplify the signal from structure and will give us many more predictions than we get from structure alone. Uh, some other features of uh, the, the, you know, what we find. If we use the protein data bank alone, uh, we make 47,000 predictions. If we use it uh, just from structure, for, with homology modeling, we get up to 127,000. If we use other sources of evidence, again, the PDB alone, 250,000. With homology models, 1.3 million. So we're getting an enormous amplification from homology models. Now, the data and the evidence from, structure, from PDB structures is much better than the evidence from homology models. But the evidence from homology models is still, is still useful. Another way of looking at this, if we look at close structural homologs, say the same family or superfamily, uh, 
This shows you that we make 47,000 predictions and we get very few predictions from distant structural relatives. But if we now combine this with other sources of information, we get enormous, you know, most of our predictions are from proteins that are distantly related. And this is a crucial, again, a crucial reason why this stuff, as you'll see, works well. Uh, it's the combination of structural information with non-structural information. So uh, everybody has their stories of getting published. We submitted this to Nature, and uh, uh, people wanted experiments, uh, as it seems reasonable, except it's hard to do an experiment on 1.3 million interactions. Uh, but uh, Cliff Zhang, who was, uh, was doing the work, uh, had friends in labs around the country. and. Uh, he, uh, he, he basically asked them to give him proteins they were interested in. He would make predictions if they would test them. And uh, he had 19 proteins from different labs, actually most at Columbia, but one Tony Hunter at Salk. Uh, of the 19, 15, the predictions he made were correct. So even though we had statistical studies on million proteins, this 19 is what got us into nature. Uh, and uh, statistically, it's meaningless. But so that was one sort of test that we did. Um, and this is just one example. I talked to I talked yesterday about cadherins. We're interested in interactions between protocadherins and other proteins, tyrosine kinases. Uh, we made a prediction uh, where the interface was. Found there was a key tryptophan there. Maniatis lab mutated it, and we abrogated the interaction. So we are able, when we have a structural model, to make testable predictions uh, in, in some detail. Um, there are so many other databases of protein-protein interactions, and the most sort of notable ones are taken from high-throughput experiments, such as yeast to hybrid measurements uh, from the Vidal lab. Uh, Bioplex is a database taken from uh, tandem infinity mass spec measurements. And we obviously look to see to what extent our database overlaps other databases. And this is a general feature of high throughput databases, is nothing overlaps. It's somewhat uh, disconcerting, but uh, it either means that most, mostly we're making lots of mistakes, or there are lots of interactions that just get detected because different proteins are being studied and different methods are, are being used. But these are the two sort of standard, gold standard high throughput databases. So I'm going to give you a sense now of how our predictions compare to those. Uh, so we have, we, we have to assemble data sets that we Test one are the ones I've already mentioned, data sets with two literature references. Uh, for the positive set, the negative set is everything else. But the Vidal group at Harvard has assembled very, very high quality data sets that we had nothing to do with, with positive known protein-protein interactions and proteins that are known not to interact. So if we plot true positive rate versus false positive rate, ignore the gray curve. This is our preppy predictions. This is the yeast 2 hybrid data, and this is the mass spec data. And you can see that uh, we're doing very well. So there's evidence that preppy is comparable to high throughput experimental data. Now I should say high throughput experimental data is lousy, but uh, you know, this is, this, again, the state of the field. The nice thing about Preppy is you just have to go to our, our website and click and get a prediction if you're interested in a particular class of proteins. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll actually get to that in, in a second, but uh, 
I'm sort of taking you through different applications of preppy. But yes, bio, bio, they spent, the, the, they, they do try to reconstruct protein-protein complexes. And we try to do that as well. And you'll, you'll, you'll see in a, in a moment really, really how well uh, we do. Um, so here we're just looking at this carefully curated database. This is the likelihood ratio cutoff, and 600 is our cutoff for sort of high probability. And you can see that we reproduce about 70% or 60% of the interactions in this database. Uh, and this is a database of interactions which don't exist. And you see that at a cutoff of 600, we don't get any of those. So this is sort of adding to the reliability of our, our cutoff measure. Uh, Bioplex and the East 2 hybrid database just reproduce a much smaller number simply because they're smaller. Uh, so we are picking up a fairly large number of known interactions without using the information in those uh, interactions. This, this is uh, so going to lead to some place we're going. There's a database of uh, disease-related genes called ClinVar. There are other such databases. And uh, there are disease mutations, uh, so some of those have no mutations. But we looked in that database of, for proteins that are associated with the same disease. And we asked, do we predict that some of them interact with each other? And what this is supposed to tell you is that we find of these 3,700, we find that 500 are predicted to interact with each other and 300 don't appear in another database. But if we take now the same number of proteins randomly chosen, but so they don't appear in the same disease, we, uh, we predict only 41 interact with each other. So this is giving us some indication that maybe PREPI can be used to infer something about disease-related proteins. So this is actually a very striking result, the difference between disease-related proteins and predicting that, you know, that they do interact. And again, the other, other existing databases find a very small number make a very small number of these predictions. So somehow, I mean, it seems reasonable that if two proteins are associated with the same disease, they'll have a higher probability of interacting than if they're not. And, and, and we're picking that up. Uh, this is a, a graph. Uh, and I'm sorry I'm sort of overwhelming you with graphs. I'll try to stop soon. Uh, of, the pro of the fraction of of mutations, of SNPs, uh, in an predicted in an interface. Uh, so in a, in a series of uh, sort of pro uh, disease-related proteins, we look at their SNPs, SNPs we see here about 15% are predicted to be in an interface. Uh, if we take uh, SNPs that are benign, much smaller number are predicted to be in an interface. So this is going to also point to something we can do. Can we use our predictions to ask if a particular mutation disrupts, you know, has, has, has a, you know, a, an effect on a protein-protein interaction. Um, so we have all these results that are very encouraging. And finally, uh, in terms of your question about protein-protein complexes, what we did is we, we take, this is exactly what the Bioplex people did. You have a protein-protein complex. In this case, uh, it has four proteins. And we ask, what is the likelihood ratio of an interaction between each of them? And uh, can we recapitulate the complex uh, at a certain likelihood ratio? So this one, these two are found to interact with LR1, LR2, LR4. Somehow three disappeared. But these three connections are enough to recapitulate the complex. And we ask, what is the minimum LR that recapitulates a given protein-protein complex, uh, and as in, in a database called Corum. And you see that at our cutoff of 600, we get about 70% of the complexes. So we're able, in principle, we have information to recapitulate protein-protein complexes. Again, the other databases just don't have the same coverage. It's the, so in principle, the, the, just sort of an aside, we could take this information and and try to rebuild a complex from start. Remember, here I've started with a known complex and, and asked, 
can we account for the fact that there is a complex? But if I try to simply take a given protein and all of its interactors, I'd have too much information. So what, to actually rebuild complexes from st scratch is something we're working on, but I, I, I'm not convinced we're, we're go going to do it. Uh, we'll see. So this uh, uh, sort of summarizes my attempt to convince you that Preppy is a useful tool. And I'll just point out that we're using the same structural blast approach to, uh, to now to look for protein small molecule interactions. So, and the goal here would be given a complex to, to see whether, you know, other, well, to, to predict perhaps small molecule inhibitors of, 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 of disease related proteins or, or whatever. But we're, we're working on that and it hasn't, uh, hasn't led to a publication yet. So in the time remaining, I'd like to sort of point to some new directions we're taking with this. Uh, although I guess well, this is something we, we, we are publishing. There is something some of you may be familiar with called gene set enrichment analysis. And basically there are publications where proteins of a known function are classified in a particular gene set, uh, which, you know, associated with the same function. So what we've done is the following. We take a query protein, and this is a list of its most likely interactor, second most likely, third, fourth, whatever. And we ask, is there an enrichment in a particular gene set? So if you look at these, the three purple proteins are they're number two, three, four, and six. So three of our highest confidence predictions belong to gene set one. Uh, so this gray one, is so the gray is distributed, so there's no enrichment. So one can take these predictions and ask, are certain protein functions enriched? And use that to infer the function of the query protein Q itself. So the basic notion is if a protein's interactors belong to a same, uh, some gene set, then the protein itself is more likely to belong to that gene set. So this is a way of inferring protein function and this tells you we st studied uh, 10,000 proteins, uh, 2,000 of those, the known function was in its most likely gene set and about half were in the top 10. So this, I think, is a novel way to infer protein function by asking what the function of its interacting proteins is. And this is something, again, we've, we've, we've been pushing. So th this, uh, now the last few slides are going to sort of, in a very, very hand-waving way, this is more like a grant application, something that we've started to do now. So there are disease mutations, there are people, do GWAS studies and they find SNPs that may be associated with this and that disease. And the question is then how do you analyze what that SNP might be doing? And the only method currently used to analyze SNPs is to look at, see whether it might affect protein stability. So if you have a SNP that looks like it's say a buried charge in a protein, if you know the structure, you might infer it's disrupting the structure. But protein-protein interactions are not directly taken into account. And in this terribly complex slide, I just want to give you the notion of what we're working on. This is a protein P, which is, say, identified as being associated with a certain disease. So we look, this is sort of its interactome and the interactions of its interactors. We construct these networks. And then we can ask different questions. Does it have disease-related SNPs? Do its partners have disease-related SNPs? If there are other proteins associated with that disease, do they have SNPs that, uh, you know, that, that, that have a, a phenotype? And by doing this, we are, we started doing this, we're, we're able to assign function to different SNPs, to basically expand the information we have, but not only looking at the protein which has a SNP, but looking at the proteins around it that, have, that might have similar functions that are affected. So our goal ultimately is to take SNPs and identify them with protein networks rather than with individual proteins. So this is one direction that, that we're sort of going with this. Um, another direction is, which gets back to the 
prediction of interfaces is to look more deeply at individual cases because ultimately, you know, we have this method, but we'd like to use it. We hope others do as well. So we've become interested in KRAS pathways. Now, KRAS is a protein associated with many cancers. Uh, it, uh, it, and KRAS mutations are believed, people have not been able to, to drug KRAS. It, it uh, catalyzes the uh, GDP, so there's a GDP, GTP cycle, and it's known that when it binds uh, GDP, it basically doesn't bind to downstream effectors. When it binds GTP, it does. Uh, and these are, this is a sort of pictures of our protein interface prediction method showing you that the GDP uh, surface binds to uh, known, its known interactors and the GTP surface binds in a different region to other proteins. So we're looking sort of closely at the difference between uh, GTP and GTP bound forms of KRAS. Uh, we've used PREPI to uh, annotate, uh, to find uh, partners of KRAS and there are already many pathways associated with KRAS and most of the pathways we've identified the proteins that are that are known to interact but we now we have a bunch of proteins that are not known to interact and we're now testing those experimentally so our goal because people haven't succeeded in drugging KRAS and in inhibiting its function is to find new pathways and hopefully be able to attack its effects that way. So th this is a major focus in my lab now, using PREPI to, to find new pathways of, sort of known, known oncogenes. And finally, a sort of another area we're working on. Uh, so many of these interactions take place on membrane surfaces. KRAS uh, has a membrane, uh, there's two actually membrane attraction binding modules. So many of the interactions take place in the 2D environment of a membrane. This is an example of a uh, sort of a K KRAS pathway where it, it activates PI3 kinase, which uh, phosphorylates PIP2 to PIP3, which then attracts other proteins to a membrane surface. And there's a whole cycle here of interactions. Uh, most of them are known. We were able to add a uh, sort of a preppy prediction that these two proteins interact on a membrane surface. And again, that's being tested experimentally. So we think that, uh, again, by looking in detail at particular pathways, uh, sort of motivated by the hypotheses preppy has generated, that we'll be able to look deeply into specific biochemical problems as opposed to the sort of the more general list of hypotheses that we provide. So that's it. Uh, I just want to mention the people that uh, were involved in this work. Uh, Donald Petrie is a senior scientist in my lab who uh, is involved in everything we do. Uh, Cliff Zhang wrote the first copy of, uh, first version of Preppy. He's now back in China. Uh, Nacho Garzon, Hawuk Wang uh, did most of, most of the programming on both Preppy and Predus. Uh, Diana Murray is a senior scientist in my lab uh, who sort of motivates much of this research. And Andrea Califano is uh, my colleague in the Department of Systems Biology at Columbia. Andrea uh, is a card-carrying systems biologist who, who works on cancer pathways. And he, he works on using, say, co-expression information. He'll look at, uh, he'll look at tumors see what proteins are overexpressed in tumors, see what proteins are overexpressed in normal cells or underexpressed, and from that information uses reverse engineering to, to generate biochemical pathways, signaling pathways. So we, we are working with him to intro, introduce structure into that, that line of research, and, and that's where we're going with this. So uh, I think the message uh, I'm trying to, to give is that we're at the very earliest stages of introducing structure into this area of systems biology, but I think it adds a perspective that really hasn't been there before. And with that, I'll stop and thank you for your attention.
building complex that requires subtle structural rearrangement of reaction? Can this apply to those? So in principle, yes, but this is what I was saying at the beginning, where if, if you ask me, what about alternate conformations of proteins? Uh, that's not information, that some proteins have conformational change, I know, I know that. Uh, but I'm just, so that, we're not dealing with that. We're, we're dealing with things at a much cruder level. Even if a protein undergoes a conformational change, if I superimpose, so if I take the RAS case, there's a GDP and a GTP structure, they're different, there are some loops that move. I can use either structure in a crude way to predict whether it binds to another protein because most of the secondary structure elements are in place. So it's, it's, it's this point I was making, we can't, in this sort of problem, we can't worry about detailed <laughs> structural information we, because we're trying to do things on a genomic scale. Once we have a hypothesis, then we can look more closely, run molecular dynamics, do docking, whatever you want. The idea first is to find new hypotheses about what proteins interact, and then to worry about what you're, worry, what you're worrying about. But if we worry about it at the beginning, we won't be able to do anything. That's, that's, that's the issue that we're, we're sort of dealing with. <coughs> Yesterday you presented uh, an interaction that was almost undetectable but was actually important mm -hmm. in the context of uh, other interactions. Uh, I don't know if stability was very much part of the prep the algorithm. It seemed to be a major component. So it's possible that within your uh, million of predictive interactions, there are some that are uh, functionally important but undetectable, maybe not. Uh, I, I'm sure that I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure. That, in fact, most of our million interactions may not even be physical. They may be just functional. We we, we detect physical ones by the structural score. But to make the point, there are two interactions I talked about yesterday: a trans interaction and a cis interaction. We detect the trans with preppy. We don't detect the weak cis interaction with preppy. But remember, that's really weak. That's in solution. That's yeah, but you know, if you're not putting stability into the context, right? You might be able to. I mean, if something is in a way conservation of, of structure is important in this case, if I understand correctly. Mm -hmm. So if if the functional side has been preserved, but the, it's very much on the weak side of the spectrum, you might actually potentially capture it. But I guess it's not. Okay. I mean, we we do capture weak weak interactions in some cases. The stability. I mean, again, it would be too much. We don't, we don't have that information for tens of billions. We just don't have it. So this is all based on using structural similarity that's, that's, and, and saying we can carry that up until a point to generate hypotheses. I mean, it's, it's annoying. You know, it's all my life I've worked on, you know, as I said, every angstrom, I cared about every angstrom and every kilocalorie. And now I don't in this, in this research. I can't. Yeah. So, so we've, we, we didn't get a chance to talk about it. We, we've started sort of rewriting preppy for viral host interactions. And yes, we, it's all, right now it's all structure based. So we don't think we'll do as well, but we're, you know, we, we're, we're hoping uh, to see if you, if you take, say, Zika virus. So I know where the money is. So it's, it's Zika virus. We're, we're going to look at what predictions we make for chicken, what predictions we make for human, to see what's different. But I don't expect it to be as effective just for the reason you, you mentioned. And the other, um, you mentioned the structure-enabled SNP interaction, mm -hmm. uh, where you're looking at a single SNP and how it propagates. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you're, uh, it would seem to be that you could extend that to SNP-SNP -SNP interaction. Yes, yes. It's all, I, I, that, that slide I had was, too complicated, but yes, we, we will be, that's just the goal, to c extend it to that as well. I have a question, I'll take host privilege and I'll get to 
but uh, it's a little bit related to the question that Alessandro asked. So, so some years ago, I had a postdoc, and we, uh, you know, we did a um, binding site model for protein-protein interactions, mm -hmm. same, you know, kind of same functionality mm -hmm. as, um, you know, Predis and Whiskey. And we ran into a problem, which is that we could we could predict the binding sites correctly, but then we get a lot of false positives, and they were kind of scattered uniformly. Mm -hmm. They'd be a patch on mm -hmm. the backside mm -hmm. of the protein. So how do you really, you know? So we figured this is probably like a binding site for another interaction partner. So how do you even how do you even know what your true negatives are when you test these things? Uh, so it's a great question. Uh, all the questions are great questions, actually. I've never said to anyone, that's a really bad question, but that's really good. <laughs> um, so th this came up so, uh, in, in, in PREDAS 2, and what we've done is we've, uh, so, so we have a, um, you know, a data set which, that people use to test their predictions, and those are known strong protein-protein predictions. You probably use the same benchmark set. But what we've now done is take our predictions and s separated them into patches. And we have our st most strongly predicted patch, our second, our third, our fourth. And we're actually thinking that the weaker patches might have something to do with protein solubility. So uh, if, you, if you see, a, a, like, for example, drug companies are interested in antibodies that, uh, you know, th that, that behave properly, that you could use as drugs. So sometimes they precipitate out a solution. And, we're, we're sort of looking at data now to see if auxiliary patches might be involved in that or perhaps another protein-protein interaction. So, but we are classifying our most likely patch, our second most likely patch, et cetera. So that's, that's how that's going. Okay. Uh, uh, so, so does the, the benchmark set that you use for, for, for training, I mean, these are mostly, I would imagine, are, are, are high um, interaction uh, energy um, uh, cooking pairs. And if you look at these interactional maps, there are usually, you, you see these nodes and you know, sort of handful of mm -hmm. big ones. And, and I'm imagining, you know, perhaps the benchmarks that might be populated by, by disproportionately by these mm -hmm. interactions. And so if you want to look for, say, weaker transient interactions, and if you take out, say, some of these proteins out from your test set, um, I'm wondering if your likelihood ratios might change and maybe a new feature set might emerge that might sort of capture these transient interactions. I think as we, you know, the trouble is we need a data set of transient interactions to think about. So I think, I think you're right that we are, there is a bias towards stronger interactions. And, um, you know, again, I don't quite know what to do with that unless I have a data set that I can sort of retrain our, our, our parameters for the for weak interactions. But uh, I expect that weak interactions are just like strong interactions, just less, less so, so that the same, same parameters might be used for both, but don't know. Um, so, so the question is preppy for protein DNA. Yes, that's something we actually want to do. It, it won't get us at the problems that you and I worked on of, of specificity, but it, 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 I think it can be used to identify protein DNA and protein RNA binding regions and protein surfaces. You, you start with complexes, superimpose the proteins, see where the DNA is, and perhaps use that together with electrostatic properties to see if this is likely to bind to a nucleic acid. So yes, that's something we're actually beginning to do. We're, we're doing preppy for drugs, we're doing preppy for, pro, for DNA, for RNA, and for membrane surfaces. Because many proteins interact with membrane surfaces, sometimes specifically to particular phospholipids. So we're, we're even making a preppy phospholipid version. So we're, we're doing all that stuff. Let's uh, give Barry a hearty round of thanks for... Thank you.